Um, just to really quickly introduce, um, Auto Italia, Auto Italia South East is a London-based artist from project and studio. Um, and throughout the history of our project, we've been really interested in exploring Auto Italia under many different guises. Um, as a space, as an organisation, as a charity, as an artist, as a collective, and also as a community group. And this is something that we want to kind of run through today and kind of just briefly run over all the different ways we work, um, the types of people we work with and the kind of projects we're thinking about at the moment. And we're going to explore this through a tarot reading that we had done for Auto Italia last year. Um, and the question for the tarot is, how will Auto Italia cope with making artwork in the future? Yeah. So I'm just going to read a little short thing and then we're just going to talk through some projects and show you some images. I'm sorry if I disappear behind this lamp a bit. I'll come back in a second. Um, so tarot cards have been around since about the 15th century. Thought first to have been used for card games and then in the 18th century becoming popular among mystics and occultists. The practice fits within the realm of cartomancy, using cards to gain insight into past, present and future situations. While I remain sceptical about the mystical properties, I'm very drawn to the concept of the cards functioning as instruments to tap into the subconscious, or even beyond that, into a collective unconscious. Those instincts and archetypes common among our species, represented through so-called universal symbols, such as the tree of life, the tower, the moon, the fool, what can tools like tarot help us better understand about ourselves? Last year, under the pretense, or with the excuse, of creating a new body of work, investigating creative coping strategies for artists, we had a tarot reading done for Auto Italia, asking the question, how will Auto Italia cope making work in the future? It was a time when a lot was in flux for Auto Italia. We had no permanent space in London from which to work and share work from, and two of the four core artistic members were just confirming moving abroad. The access to space question wasn't something new. We've been a nomadic group since we started in 2007, squatting or taking on disused or donated buildings for six to 12 month periods. What was new was the feeling that there was no potential to find any new space in London, the property market now at a point so beyond our means and those of other artists in the city. Already struggling to manage the amount of administration that needed dealing with in order to produce creative work and not just cater to the organisational demands of Auto Italia, we were thinking a lot about what Auto Italia even was or what it should be. It can be an artistic collaboration, it can be a group of artists working together, it can be a space that shows work, an organisation, a charity, a network of people. Our position has changed a lot since the tarot reading and that's what we'll sort of take you through now. Um, but at the moment, the current setup is two of the four of us are living in Amsterdam and Berlin. Ed and myself remain in London. And we've just recently secured a low-cost space in London from which uh, we can share our projects, which we launched in June, just gone. Um, potentially, we have it for five years, but it's also the first time we've ever had to pay a proper rent. So. The precarity in terms of being able to afford to keep doing it is, is higher than ever. Our tarot reading came from a blurring of art making process and an actual need for guidance. So here I'm going to take you through the first card. Uh, so the first card we got in the position of present influence was the Wheel of Fortune upside down. You need to maintain the knowledge that things are uncertain. If something doesn't work, that is not a bad thing. Everything comes back around. I think in terms of this card, what we were thinking about a lot was the nomadic nature of our project, but how that was maybe coming to an end. So historically, we used to work through donated buildings, um, often quite large warehouse spaces in the south of London, which were donated to us by housing organisations before they were due to be demolished and then redeveloped into flats. I think most of them mm -hmm. have become flats. So we always knew going in that we'd only have six months or 12 months. It was always quite a quick process of just trying to do as much as we could in a space and then move on to the next one. Um, in 2012, that model stopped being possible. A kind of a combination of the squatting laws in London changing around that time, so it becoming far more difficult to just occupy a space without going through a lot of legal legislation. And the fact that there just weren't these empty spaces 
lying around unused anymore. There'd been the massive sort of rebuilding push in London, everything was being regenerated. So for about 12 months we just didn't have a space, um, concentrated on working on our studio practice, concentrated on receiving commissions as Auto Italia, um, and then trying to work out how, what the assets we did have, although not material, like how they could still be generous to the artists that we wanted to engage with. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess thinking about the wider question of London as this really, what we see as a really unsustainable place, but trying to work out some way to still exist within it. A lot of the artists that we worked with were moving out at that time. Um, we were thinking about moving out, two of us did move out, so it was very much an added stress put on us purely by the kind of physical nature of the city and how mm -hmm. people were struggling to work within it. Yeah, I think also like a lot of these questions are really kind of core concerns of a lot of the work that we've produced with Auto Italia, whether that's the artwork we've produced as part of kind of our studio practice or that kind of forms part of the public programmes that we collaborate on or produce as well as artists. Um, and this project, for example, is Meet Z, which is a web project that was developed um, with the support of the BBC and the Space, which is kind of an arts council initiative in the UK, um, which was really kind of trying to, in, well, was doing many things. Partly one was a really exciting opportunity to kind of work with a coder really long term and kind of enabled the resources of kind of like a very expert kind of technical support to come into Auto Italia very briefly, but always also was really trying to kind of interrogate like what the creative producer was in London at that moment and like what it meant to occupy particular spaces in London at that time. And in between 2013 and 15 or so, I was working from a space in King's Cross, which is one of the biggest redevelopment sites in Europe, I think. Um, and it's been turned into basically a big kind of set of luxury condos, effectively. The central St. Martin's into the middle of it, the new building. And we were offered a donated space through a partnership with a property developer. Um, during that time, a lot of our projects, including Meet Z, were truly, really trying to kind of interrogate what it meant to be making work as an artist in those positions and what it meant to be a creative producer at that moment in London. Yeah, and a lot of the work at this time was really reflecting as well on the geography of where we found ourselves, kind of trying to work out what this landscape was. This, you can kind of see her looking at, it's a bit blurry on here, but she's looking out onto a sort of new version of King's Cross as we saw it being built at that time. Um, and this space was, it's constructed as if it's a new kind of public area in London. There's lots of like plazas and fountains and wide zones, but it's a completely privatised area. It's controlled by private police, private security, You'll never see a homeless person there at all. People have moved on quite discreetly, quite quickly. Um, and obviously they have quite an interesting relationship to artists. They're very interested in bringing in artists to that area to do public, public projects. Um, but really it's a kind of activation of space. So nothing is seen to be either empty or abandoned. Everything's always really like productive and active, mm -hmm. uh, which was something we were trying to work through a lot during our time that I kind of you know, who's using who in this, in this mm -hmm. um, exchange. I think this is also something that like, as artists in London, you often find yourself in a position of, because um, it's, I mean, definitely over the last 20 years, there's been a very big push for like local councils, but also kind of big government to move artists into areas of the city so that they can quickly generate new forms of footfall, they quickly redevelop, they quickly gentrify, and then they move artists back out. You see this happen with the Olympics, is a really classic situation. There's also cases of places like Spitalfields, which is an area of kind of central East London, which they used, Tracy Emin was quite central to kind of the use of, she was quite central to the redevelopment of that area, moving kind of YBAs into it, making public sculptures, then moving everyone back out of it, and moving and kind of moving corporate organisations into them. Um, but we've always been kind of in this position with Auto Italia and like many people in the community that are around us of what is, like, what is our role within that and like we're kind of pushed into these situations all the time and we don't, we feel like we don't really have any agency in that because we need these spaces to kind of programme and show work and share the resources that we can pull together. Um, so our projects really, and always, but particularly during that time, really tried to negotiate what it meant to be in those positions at, the, at that moment. So, the next card is a media obstacle, the hermit. A card of introspection. Don't overthink things. No navel gazing. It will be an obstacle to get too stuck inside your heads. Um, so, this is a picture of uh, a plant called um, 
the Dodder um, or Hailweed. Um, it's a plant that is like a vampire plant. So it looks like a big pile of spaghetti, as you can see. Um, and it grows over other plants and sucks the life out of them, detaches its own roots, and then just continues to move. Um, so we were kind of really interested in this plant this year um, as we took off first ever kind of per more permanent project space. Um, particularly kind of thinking through this idea that um, Autotalia was this kind of vessel or shell company or shell corporation that would kind of enable something to happen for ourselves as artists or the artists that we work with or the community we kind of form around it in which um, which wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Um, sorry, I've kind of slightly lost the thread of my conversation. I think there. you were talking yeah. about collaboration and competition. Yes, collaboration and competition, sorry. And the idea of collaboration and competition is not being two completely opposite things. Um, so after being nomadic for so long, we were kind of offered this kind of quite incredible resource of a potential long-term project space. And we were just kind of increasingly thinking, what does it mean to have that resource? Like, how can we really push it? Like, who can we involve in Austria Italia? How can that be really useful for loads of people? How can it be like the shell of this organization that loads of people can just keep on reaping things out of? And like, how can we at moments become an institution just momentarily? to kind of enable people to do something, whether that's access funding they wouldn't have otherwise been able to get, or reach artistic <laughs> collaborators that they just really, really admired, um, or hire some really low cost kit to make a film because the institution was behind them. Autotally was kind of able to do that, and we were able to push it to be that at moments. So, yeah. yeah. I think as well, thinking of Hailweed, this idea of Autotalia potentially being a host for things, but also being quite parasitic, and that not necessarily being a negative thing, but really trying to use this structure of Autotalia to get access to far more things than we could as individuals and the artists we collaborate with could. I think it's worth saying as well that we always work collaboratively, so if we receive a commission as Autotalia and we want to work on it as artists, it would be at least the four of us, but usually not just the four of us. Mm -hmm. We try and extend it out, invite different artists that we're interested in to work with us in different ways. Um, and similarly, when we are more interested in developing projects that we're not really as sort of creating as artists, even though I think we get approached everything as artists, but we still tend to offer up like our research questions, our themes, the things we're interested in, in working through and try and invite a lot of different people to engage with that and have a conversation and see what that um, could lead to. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, yeah, it's quite amorphous and sometimes people want to know well who did what and it's not really as clear cut as that. We try and blur the kind of production boundaries between things. Although at the while, are also really interested in kind of making the labour behind things really clear. So I think we'll get into this a bit later, but we've been working a little bit the past year, not so much recently, with kind of creating uh, CGI images and using a certain aesthetic of production, but are also really interested in unpicking, well, how you actually make those images. It's not just a click on a computer. There's like a huge amount of different people from different um, backgrounds working together just to generate one thing. And I think that's also interesting to unpick. And that comes back to this sort of idea of Autotalia as a network, as this kind of expanding mm -hmm. thing, which doesn't really have any clear boundaries mm -hmm. around it. And I think you also really see this throughout the history of Autotalia, where there's been, we have one member of the team who was one of the founders in 2007, but since then there's been a host of different directors who have kind of come on board, kind of really taken the organisation in different directions at different moments, and it's kind of become this quite generative kind of research-based organisation in which everything kind of comes down to these kind of active research questions that the people leading at that moment kind of want to explore, whether that, as Marianne was saying, is as an artistic project or it's a film commission or a public programme or um, a youth initiative with people from a local community. They all kind of come under this kind of wider umbrella of what we can kind of enable as this kind of amorphous um, organisation. Mm -hmm. And here we did have a kind of public moment. We had a show of the same name. I think it's what we opened the space with actually. So it was like our launch project. And we tried to test out this idea of can we make Auto Italia a bit more of a vessel to host 
different conversations that were happening in London like at all in that moment. Um, so we had uh, the Syria Mobile Phone Film Festival, who are a group that uh, come together to offer grants for artists and people who wouldn't consider themselves artists but are interested in working with film to make films, so Syrian artists either still in Syria or um, in exile from the country. Um, and then they also work going into Syria and taking film work from outside the country in and just showing it um, where they can. So we were quite interested in that. In, in terms of what they make, it's interesting, but also in terms of a different model for distribution and production and creating your own um, completely independent form of sharing, uh, which was obviously to do in a very specific situation. We also had the Research Centre for Proxy Politics, who are a group based out of the University de Kunst in Berlin. And I think they grew out of um, Hito Stiles class, she kind of initiated the group. And they, I mean, they're a research group, they generally produce texts, and we were quite interested in um, what it would look like if they made a visual piece. So we worked with them to do that for, the, I think, the first time they'd ever worked together as kind of visual artists. Um, we had Suzanne Trister, who is a London-based artist um, who's working a lot with like different fictions and creating these different fictional characters who produced work. And she was, she's like of a slightly old generation that wouldn't previously have had any connections to Auto Italia, but we were really interested in opening that up as well. And Aima Ariola, who's more of a writer, who's working on a kind of manifesto for different modes of production and different modes of kind of being. Um, so it was a really interesting project that was, felt like a real mishmash of different mm -hmm. things, but all bringing back to us trying to work through what we could do as a generous space and what conversations around production and distribution should we be having that mm -hmm. we weren't having before. Mm -hmm. So the next card we got um, was justice and this is in the place of the specific goal. You can't survive without being fair. Your goal is not to crush others. So here we were thinking um, about how we work with artists, the different ways in which we try and engage people, um, the different ways where we try and create maybe like a network for support or skill sharing or like peer learning. Um, and often we go into projects sort of from a position of not really knowing that much, like not being experts, not knowing too much about the modes that we want to engage with. Um, and this project is a really good example of that. So it's an image from Auto Italia Live, which was an artist made TV broadcast, we called it, although it was just streamed um, online. And it had nine one hour episodes, with the first being in 2010, and then the last one being in 2012. And they were sort of in three batches. So it was like the first one had five episodes, the second one had three, and the final one had one. And the project was sort of initiated by us wanting to think through what the format of television or what the format of broadcast could mean for artists. Could this be a way that we take control of our own means of distribution and create something that we have complete control over the sharing of? What would it mean to invite artists who don't normally work with film or video to engage with that as a sort of provocation? And also for it to be artist made. So you can see the, the girl sitting here is Meta Yule. And at the time, she was, I think, a second year at art school who was helping out on the project and was really interested in learning about video mixing. And no one knew how to do video mixing. So we said, well, why don't you just learn how to do it and in the end, she was the one live mixing on the actual broadcast. So this really nice thing of, you know, when it came down to it, it was like a 20 year old just managing what you actually saw when it went live, which I think is really great. Mm -hmm. Similarly, there were lots of different artists involved learning the different skills needed to pull this together. It was before um, streaming websites like Ustream were really kicking off. So there wasn't quite the same easy access to online streaming technologies. So it was all about like working through that. Um, as well, what's interesting in it is when we approached a lot of the artists um, to take part, we didn't really know so much what we were asking them. So people were like, oh, do you want me to be like a TV host? Or do you want me to make a new piece of work? Or do you want me to show a video? And it was sort of, well, you could do all of that or any of it. And let's see what happens when we start experimenting with these new forms of 
of performance. And the show really changed from the first one to the last one. By the time we did the last one, we'd kind of started imagining it as an episode sort of as a whole, less of a variety show almost. And we were working with some artists who were taking on the role of like script writers and script editors who were collecting everyone's sort of individual performance and working with them to create this like full, I mean, to call it like linear, linear narrative would not be right. It's still really weird, but you know, to create this thing that like really flowed from the beginning to the end. And um, we took a lot of inspiration from like going down and watching a news broadcast going out live and like seeing how these tools within the industry actually worked and were used and thinking, well, what, how can we use that? What can we do with it? I think we also see with Autotai Live and also kind of many Autotai projects before and since um, is that we'll often bring together many different practitioners, um, whether they're artists, designers, curators, writers, coders, and really invite in all of those different skills and put them all on like a level playing field and everyone is really understood as an artist and really kind of enable a situation in which all these people can kind of come together and share those skills and like learn how to live stream something over the internet. Um, but also kind of making that like a really core cool concern to the work and again thinking through like ideas of creative practice and collaboration and creative labour and allowing them to come really kind of key concerns of the topics which, uh, which are explored through different programmes. Um, I mean I can think of projects like Poly Myth X Misinformation which was in 2014 which I think probably no one in the project overall would work entirely within kind of the sphere of contemporary art all the time um, and we've always been really excited about working with people who might be coders or might make music videos or might have another form of kind of commercial creative practice and actually being like wait we can really bring these skills into these projects and actually develop some really exciting work and kind of really redevelop our understandings of, of the formats of kind of exhibitions or uh, live projects or live events. And um, this one too had another little interesting thing of like, it was a, when we did this one, it was a massive project with I think about 50 artists working on it, huge scale. And when we did the first ones, we had no budget, so no one was getting paid to do it. Everyone was just working together to make it happen. But it became this question of how can we be more useful than that? So like, if people aren't getting paid, what can we try and do with this project that is useful or enables something in the future? Um, and one of the things that we explored with the early one was kind of what copyright might look like in this situation, which is something none of us had ever thought about. But we managed to get access to a copyright lawyer who helped us draw up a contract that's really specific to this. So it means that every artist who took part has equal uh, copyright claim on the project, which felt like we needed to do. We needed to make this a thing that everyone kind of collectively had a say over its future. So whenever we get asked to show any of these, it's, we have to go back to like everyone who is involved. We check everyone wants it to be shown. And that really kind of has influenced where it's traveled since, mm -hmm. um, which is just another interesting thing that we were exploring with this, as well as the kind of just making it was like, well, what are the different mechanisms working in television or broadcast? <clears throat> so the next card is Past Foundations, the Chariot. Um, a card of tradition and control. This control needs to be reassessed. Um, think of the past. Um, this is a project called Father, uh, Father of the Sun. Um, and this is one of the really old Autotai buildings um, in which kind of a series of different commissions were painted onto the front of it. Um, but I kind of, from the card, I kind of wanted to return to this idea of like Autotalia is this kind of artistic project in which we. Um, at different moments are involved in kind of different capacities and so as a research project we'll develop like 12 month research ideas that we kind of want to explore um, and within that there might be moments where conversations that are four years old might become public or there might be moments where um, <laughs> where um, a, series of, okay, <laughs> a series of exhibitions will come together um, and that would be a kind of a way of exploring those kind of different research questions. And I think kind of increasingly we're always really in, interested in um, kind of allowing loads of different interjections to come into Auto Italia and really allowing other people to disrupt the Auto Italia kind of system and um, allowing people within our kind of networks to kind of come in and 
whether that's artists, whether that's students who come and help us out on our projects or as young people on our youth programmes, all of those kind of coming together um, at different moments. And again, kind of going back to this idea of the way in which we're kind of formed, it is this kind of organically growing artist slash organisation, which at different moments becomes all these, diff all these different things. I think one of the main things we're kind of always really cautious about is the idea that we're kind of moving towards being an institution. Um, I think because London is so precarious um, and the kind of the, the confines that are kind of put on us by certain funding requirements, for example, um, everyone kind of wants us to become like a really stable business model and soon we would have like a social media assistant or like a development coordinator and like a general manager or something and we've kind of really been interested in that we quite happy kind of keeping this quite like stable sized organization this organization at the size it is and kind of just being more and more ambitious with our projects rather than becoming more and more ambitious as like an, an organization that might develop into kind of a more structured institution um yeah, I mean, that's something that's quite especially difficult in London and especially difficult, I think, I think we're talking a bit about like how we're funded, how we actually make it happen, but there's a lot of external pressures on always growth and proving your growth and having ambitions to, even if it's just on the level of increased business numbers, increase hits on the website, increase press, increase output, and we're trying to argue that we shouldn't do that because that would actually be detrimental to how we work and there's a lot more value I think in us kind of staying the same size and almost like staying just not having this ambition to to grow but just continue which I think is the hardest argument to make especially when we're getting more and more pressures to sort of um, align our work with a kind of economic value that should be tangible so a lot of pressure to like diversify your income a lot of pressure to make every project some sort of commercially viable endeavor mm -hmm. um, not just a thing you're doing for the sake of it being good or interesting or like mm -hmm. giving people opportunities so we're really trying to negotiate how we can keep arguing for the former and for not yeah. sort of growing too quickly i think also we're always trying to kind of avoid like the public program aspect of water italia to never seem too consistent you know like we really feel that what we don't want to be is one of those organisations where you go and see an exhibition or a project or a performance and you're always like, your response to it is always the same, like, that was good. You know, like, we kind of want, we're kind of happy for things to not work sometimes and perhaps for a project to come together and there's an aspect of it which didn't really work and we kind of need to pull that apart and kind of explore what it might be in another capacity at a different time and revisit the conversations we've been having with those artists for, say, three, four years or maybe even six weeks and then go back to it at a different moment um, and kind of allow it to be a bit more sporadic and kind of responsive and interesting. And I think as a small organisation in London, we kind of have to be super responsive and sporadic because we kind of almost can't, we can't be super stable all the time. Yeah. I think the last thing on this point of kind of the people involved and how we make it work is one of the positive things that's really come out of two of our members moving away has been opening up like our eyes to completely different artists in different contexts that we hadn't heard of or hadn't thought about engaging with before. And I think there was a real danger in London to get quite fixed in this bubble of working that like a lot of people in London have a lot of shows and it's the same, often the same people who are showing a lot. And we really want to challenge ourselves to look outside of that. I think particularly since the vote to leave the EU, there's like we feel more than ever that we really need to be expanding these conversations and not be insular and not be too inward facing. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of one of our interest moving forward is trying to um, reach different artistic contexts, conversations and try in some way to either engage with that or bring it back to London or open it up. Mm -hmm. Which is always difficult being artist run and not an institution and yeah. having the resources <laughs> to do that. Yeah. So our next card we had in the place of past events was the lovers. You've been built on relationships, possibly tempestuous, but generally positive. You must remember the friendship foundation. Um, well, this is true. This is just, Otto Italia was a group of friends who had just graduated from art school in 2007, who were interested in working together using a squatted space that they had access to to do shows, to show the work of their friends, to show their own work. 
I think at the time there was a real disinterest among that group of like trying to go into the art market. No one was interested in um, getting commercial representation. No one was interested in selling at that time. Quite a lot of those artists since have gone on to explore that or to kind of have more like a solo career. Um, it's also worth noting how dominant the art market is in London. I'm sure maybe many people have visited London or been involved in different projects in London at different times, but it is so, so dominant in London. Um, increasingly now, when public money diminishing and smaller kind of non-profit things disappearing more and more, the art market becomes, seems to become stronger and stronger as freeze grows particularly. Yeah, and it's just, I mean, we really feel like it is going to just lead to a kind of like eradication of interesting, exciting, <laughs> experimental practice. So it's quite hard to see at the moment where kind of younger grassroots things could exist still or mm. if they even could. I, like it feels like if it was right now when we were starting Auto Italia, it would just be impossible. Like the conditions have changed so much since 2007 and the things that really like allowed it was access to free space, um, rents not being quite as horrendous as they are, although they still weren't cheap mm -hmm. at that time. Yeah. Um, and, and always just never forgetting this idea of kind of this idea of gener cross generational support and peer network and network building at different moments. So we'll do a lot of projects as well where we might work with an artist who has just graduated, and we'll also pair them in a project with um, someone who's much better established. So. For example, two years ago we did a project again, the Polymyth project, and we had Meta Haven in the project, who some friends of ours who've worked with, we've got a show of, of theirs at the moment, but we've worked on and off with them for a few years, alongside um, April Griman, who was, if anyone knows April Griman, she's the first like digital artist, American artist, she was the first person to use like a Mac computer effectively to kind of produce design. Um, but pairing her with like a recent graduate who was really excited about her work and really admired her work, and I think this is always what Australia has kind of been about like making work with and showing work of people that you really admire and are, like really excited about and just really want to work with and participate with in some way. Yeah. And I guess the sort of trajectory in brief of how it's worked is 2007 we started, there was no funding, it was just kind of like doing stuff in a space. Uh, we then started applying to a few small funds. There's one in um, the UK called Grants for the Arts, which is run by Arts Council England, and you can get kind of small project grants. And I think they were successful, maybe one or two of those. And then it all changed sort of substantially in 2012, where we became uh, what's called an MPO, which is National Portfolio Organisation. And basically what this means is that we started getting regular funding, so we'd receive a fixed amount each year for three years and then you reapply and get a fixed amount each year for three years and you reapply. Um, what that meant sort of practically at the time was that people could start getting paid to be working on Auto Italia, people could treat it more as like their employment even if it's still artists working together making work and it meant that the projects could become a lot more ambitious, it meant that you know a lot more time could be spent on everything. Um, it also meant that we've kind of created this thing now that we need to like feed to keep mm -hmm. to keep going so at the moment we've got there's four of us two full-time two part-time mm -hmm. um all the artists that we work with we've got our space we need to pay for yeah. we have a studio that we're trying to keep to make work from and you realize you really quickly amass like huge amount of costs so we spend a lot of time fundraising or trying to fundraise and a lot of time thinking about the model and how it could shift. And I think we're at this really interesting point right now where we're about to reapply for the regular funding for the next three, actually it's four years this time, and really having to question like what we need to change to keep this working. So we've definitely reached a point where how we work at the moment is not sustainable. So what can we do to shift it? What are new models we could try? We don't have the answers yet, but it's kind of always something that we're thinking through. Mm -hmm. And just this was just an image of um, one of the older projects called Yes Way, which was um, kind of just a massive music festival where different bands were paired up with artists to create kind of live installation works with them. Um, and this was an example of one of the things we did when we had a big warehouse space. I think it was maybe 2000 and... Eight, nine. Something like that. Mm -hmm. <coughs> 
you were going to... Me again, okay. Uh, this card is in the place of future influences, and we got the world. A positive sign, looking towards more harmony if we remember the basis of friendship. A card of travelling, indicating we could find unity elsewhere in the world. Um, I think here we were thinking a lot about what a physical space actually meant. We've had a couple of periods during our time where we haven't had a physical space and have tried to explore how we can operate without that. Um, in about 2012, we did our first ever project abroad. It was in Italy, in Turin. And I think just getting that invitation opened up a lot of doors for us. And we started to um, get invited, I mean, regularly, like once a year, twice a year, maybe at the most, to do projects in other countries, predominantly Germany, but a couple elsewhere. Um, and that really opened our eyes to this different mode of production we could be engaged with and we were interested in like kind of questioning is this something that could be a new sustainable model for us does Auto Italia actually need to get rid of all ties to physical space and just be this thing that can kind of go and accept invitations elsewhere um, it's not sustainable for us anyway <laughs> so it's not been the answer but it's really opened up our eyes to different communities to engage with um, different types of programming we could do and also that we don't have to always just be this hosting body. We actually can move. We can take artists mm -hmm. with us elsewhere. Mm -hmm. <coughs> we've, already, we've already mentioned the, the vote, which is just this depressing thing, but there was this idea that, especially within the UK, it felt like a lot of other places had potential that London didn't. We were thinking for a long time about whether we could relocate um, outside of London. I think... <coughs> We were actually approached with the offer of the low rent on the space we've just taken on. If that hadn't happened, I think we really would have... I mean, I feel like that would have been one of the only options if we wanted a physical space again, would have been to move maybe to a city like Liverpool, maybe to a, even like Glasgow or somewhere. Mm -hmm. But it is also this hard thing of within the UK, it's so much is centralised on London. It feels like there's a lot of conversations, communities, practices that somehow still managing to carry on in there and we were I don't know wary about what leaving would mean for Otto Italia although I think it could have been a positive mm -hmm. thing it could yeah. have been good but I think kind of going back to like the idea of being able to sit in that position and make those decisions is what we always find really exciting about Otto Italia and that it was kind of given a really nice name when we were talking to some artists last week that we can kind of explore the project as like a shapeshifter and there are these moments where we can just be like, you know what, maybe Autotalia is just this entirely different thing now. And, and this is actually the position we're in now in the next few months. We have to change Autotalia. So if we did this talk in six months, the way we're going to talk about it would be totally different because our model doesn't work. We will go bankrupt soon. Like, it just doesn't. So we're in the position where we are going to have to shape shift again and for us to continue to support artists and continue producing work in collaboration with different artists, we will just become a whole other different organisation. It's kind of what we find exciting about it, um, yeah. just being super amorphous. This image is from a project uh, called On Coping, which has been, I want, it kind of is still ongoing a little bit. It was initiated when we got an invitation to go with the British Council to Johannesburg and link up with an artist-led space there with the idea of doing a project with them. Um, this was a similar time to when we were working on Meet Z. We were really interrogating King's Cross as this geographical location we were working in. We were spent a lot of time being surrounded by huge advertisement hoardings for the new luxury flat complexes that were kind of being built up around us and really thinking what does it mean to be an artist in London now? Like how mm. is it even possible? Are there different tactics we can start to employ? Do we need to take on these languages of the kind of redeveloper to start um, working uh, in a more subversive way, what can we do? So we were really interested in exploring the aesthetics of a kind of um, property advertisement. Um, we were also quite interested in, I don't know, it's not really a provocation, but an idea we had of, is there a way to take the assets, the kind of usefulness of, say, brand or big company or big corporations to take the resources, but to not take their names or logos or, um, you know, not take on a project that is Auto Italia for Reebok, but what if we could somehow get access to like all the computing equipment that Reebok had? Are there ways that we can, as artists, 
um, work work sort of more undercover. We never sort of managed to get access to all of these, although I did try and talk to them, but it didn't work. Um, so we, when we went to Johannesburg, we were seeing a lot of parallels in terms of kind of rapid redevelopment, use of the artist as this kind of like really, this creative figure that would enable really like Western style regeneration. There was this whole district that we visited called Mabaneng, which is kind of bizarre. It's about four blocks long, and then the rest of it is just kind of surrounded by just motorways and deserted sort of spaces, which we found in Johannesburg quite a lot. You move between these like little concentrated zones, and then in between is just no man's land. But this one in particular was, it's all owned by one businessman. He owns the entire, um, all of it. And he'd been redeveloping it specifically to look like New York, to look like the meatpacking district. So all the street layouts, the designs of the facades of building, we're reflecting this. And then they really push it as this really like experimental creative zone where like artists hang out and drink smoothies and it's really great. And it's just it was just really incredible to see it and see this just mirrored kind of what we've seen happening in London for the past kind of ten years. And I think in London has become way more like insidious how it's used and I mean, sometimes it's not subtle, sometimes it is, but to be confronted with this zone that we were like, wow, it's so, so clear, the models that you're using. And so when we were thinking about how we could possibly present something there in a context that really we know nothing about and that we, you know, are coming in as artists from England, we wanted to insert maybe our own advertisement provocation. So it ended up, this is just a tiny little section, but there was a, a big billboard we did of a sort of, ideal interior but with um, these disruptive elements so it has kind of like the mess on the floor it's got uh, weird beetles it has kind of the spill of custard running through the other side and it had a tag on it that we were experimenting with the language of astrology so we'd come up with this sort of um, phraseology that's speaking directly to the viewer um, encouraging them to grasp hold of this you know this future that's enticing and new and uh, but then really pulling through this kind of slightly ominous uh, side of that. Again, with this, we were thinking of this idea of like sort of cultural capital in the if we can buy for like three dollars that bag that you can see the bottom of, which is a copy of a Celine bag, and it looks like exactly like a Celine bag, and we've got the Louis Vuitton there. Like if we can just buy this for no money and put it in our virtual space and render this out as an idea of this kind of ideal lifestyle, what is better, like is it actually better to own those things or is actually, can we create this like lifestyle rich, cash poor exploration of these ideas and give the tools of seeming a certain way but then undercut that. So this project's been going on a lot since. It's become a film, it's become like a manifesto. It's a fair booth. A fair booth in mm -hmm. a kind of like an artist from space. Artist spare, um, fair. Fair. And each travelled a lot, so it's been um, in Bologna, it's been in Nottingham in England, in Liverpool in England. It's also been a show with like 12 other artists working, exploring the same things. And this was the project that really started off our interest in tarot and alternative structures for decision making mm -hmm. and these ideas of like handing over control to other ways of thinking through problems. And all coming back to this kind of um, idea of on coping, like coping strategies. Are there different shared strategies we can explore? Um, I think it's also quite representative this kind of interest in Australia and reaching out to like a really wide network of people and kind of thinking of our own networks as a really expansive kind of project in itself and going out and speaking to people and thinking through like what are your coping strategies? Like what does it mean to cope as an artist in Copenhagen? Or, what does it mean to cope as an artist in Johannesburg or Bologna or Nottingham? Like, what are the strategies that you're kind of working with? Like, how are you organising yourself? Like, how do you self-organise in this space to enable yourselves to keep on making work and kind of really inviting that into being like a really core cool kind, kind of concern of the project in itself? So, the next card is the questioner and it's judgment upside down. You risk negatively judging yourself, your work, overthinking and being negative about other people. <laughs> so this is an image of a show that we didn't do. 
Um, it was a show at a space in London called Tank TV, which is associated with the Tank magazine, um, which really sadly got pulled like four days before it was going to happen. Um, and this is just a sketch up, a qu quite random sketch up, I guess, <laughs> show the of show. the show. The show's inside. <laughs> but um, which just an image that we really, really like. Um, and I guess what we kind of want to talk about with this is this idea of how we have to speak all these different languages to kind of deal with all these different outside pressures so that we can continue operating as Auto Italia. So there'll be times when within the space of like 20 minutes we'll kind of change from being a fundraising director to talking to like 16 year olds in our neighborhood about kind of what it means to like make a website and then the next 10 minutes we'll be talking about, um, I don't know, uh, post Fordism and creative labor and with a group of artists and kind of always having to kind of continually change who we are at different moments. Um, yeah, and I think like really kind of, I mean, we've talked about this a bit already, but kind of always having to kind of push against these different outside pressures to become this kind of sustainable enterprising artist. And like, it's a, there's an example I want to kind of bring up that's kind of just come up very recently where we've just got a new mayor f kind of finally in London after having a pretty awful one for quite a long time. Um, who's now the uh, foreign minister? Who's now the foreign minister? But um, who maybe many people may even know. But um, who's kind of bringing these different kind of strategies to kind of help artists in London? One of which is this idea of a creative enterprise zone, which would be two different areas of London where rents might be capped, or they're going to offer loans so artists can buy their studios. Which I guess I can, on some level, kind of on the first on the first kind of impressions sounds potentially like a good idea, but it kind of falls back on this idea that like artists should be enterprising and the all moments they should be able to kind of develop or kind of pull these different resources which like independent artists just I mean they, they just can't and like you look at the Arts Council in England for example and to receive any kind of grant to do an experimental project you have to have well it's kind of varying now but at one point it was 40% match funding, which couldn't be your own money. So there's always this idea that as an artist you're supposed to kind of generate capital in quite like a near liberal kind of uh, kind of way. And it's something that we've always really tried to use autotires to kind of push against, to really push against. And whether that's a volunteer that's at university who's applying for the first time for money from the Arts Council, just saying that we're their key partner and being like, you have this institution behind you, say Ed and Marianne are helping with this project in this way. And you can just kind of re off our institutional kind of credit in some way to kind of get these different bits of funding. Um, and kind of not ever treating or to tell you as this thing that like is owned or like um, that is ours and that everyone should feel like they have a stake from being a part of it in a different way. Um, and I think also a big thing we've always actually the conversation was having today, a really big thing we've always really pushed against in London is ever charging entry for anything because as the city becomes increasingly privatised and the creative sector becomes increasingly privatised and the gallery sector becomes increasingly private as well, we just think it's so subversive now in London to have a space where people come together and don't spend any money and can talk about ideas and can kind of collaborate and make pieces of work. Like it just doesn't, it's increasingly not happening in London. Like there are handfuls <laughs> of spaces where this happens, but really it's kind of diminishing quite a lot. Um, and there's kind of a parallel uh, trajectory in London at the moment with a lot of the kind of alternative spaces, particularly like queer spaces, uh, being shut down, um, specifically because uh, it's quite easy to go in and uh, hike the rent and often these buildings are quite central and you know what has been a kind of pub for a specific community for many years is not making enough money or not making as much money as it would if it were flats or privately owned. So in the past couple of years a lot of kind of what are community spaces, like spaces for meeting for certain groups or just spaces, again, for like being with each other and hanging out or being forced to close. So we've been thinking a lot about how Auto Italia, although coming from an art space sort of position, how we can open up and be useful and like offer space and time and ways to like talk as well and chat and not just be, like Ed said, kind of spending or consuming. Mm -hmm. And we try and do a lot of projects that are not just sort of public exhibition outcomes, but could just be like workshops or even more closed conversations that someone's interested in having. Mm -hmm. Like we're really interested in making space work in different ways like that as well. Um, 
Another example I think of kind of really important projects for Auto Italia is a project called Art Work Association, which isn't kind of strictly speaking Auto Italia. Um, however, everyone in Auto Italia is kind of on a steering committee or kind of a key member of it, which is just effectively a forum or a consortium project um, in which uh, uh, one grant was secured from the Arts Council and with that money we enable really young artists or creative workers in any kind of capacity to come together and self-programme. So it's really about, I want to do a workshop with said curator who I think is really exciting um, and we'll be like, great, we have a budget to do that, you can contact them and you can then meet this person or I want to do a bigger group workshop and with all these different kind of speakers and all these different kind of, kinds of people can come together to really enable much younger artists to kind of have an opportunity to programme and access different people in that way. Yeah, and it's just run off a mailing list, it's about 250 artists on it, it's super informal but I feel like it also enables some of the best conversations and best kind of like we've met some amazing artists mm. through doing it as well, so it's a really nice um, mm. format. Okay, the next card is environmental factors, the sun. There are overwhelmingly positive surroundings for what you want to do, a card depicting harmony. Um, I think we're kind of getting to the end, yeah. but we're quick sort of few last things. So what we do have at the moment is stability in this long-term space which is good and we're excited about it and we're excited to program as much as we can before we run out of money and then, <laughs> then we'll revisit it. Um, the other thing we're really happy that we've managed to do thus far is to really like to operate outside the art market. Like we've never sold anything. Um, we've been a part of art fairs in a curatorial program so we've made work for it but it's never then gone into circulation, it's never become available for sale. We get asked a lot if we'd ever considering sort of selling stuff as an artist. I don't know if we never would, but I just don't know what it would be. I think a lot of our projects, as you maybe got a bit of a sense, are quite open-ended. They don't often end up with a thing that then can mm -hmm. be sold or shared. And if they did, there'd be so many artists that have collaborated like to make it. That it's almost like when you have you know a band with like twelve members, well, you're not going to be like rolling in it from mm -hmm. selling your CDs because mm -hmm. you split it all out. So. I think for us, the idea of selling is maybe one that just doesn't quite make sense, doesn't really fit with, with how we work. Yeah. Um, I should say a little bit about this project. Oh, yeah. Well, this is a project called Recent Work by Artists, which is in 2013, which is one of the projects which took place in the King's Cross space, which was in partnership with Arjun, the property developer. So this is a project that was really kind of thinking through what creative workspace looked like and how creative workers were kind of being asked to work in London at that moment and kind of still now. So it's a hot desky environment um, where there is internet uh, drinks and places to sit and people are encouraged to come in and make use of that workspace. Um, so again, kind of an interesting kind of what different exhibition formats might be, but really kind of thinking through what it means to be making work in London at that moment. Um, has been a really core cool concern to, to our projects. Yeah, and the space became a kind of host for the different artists involved in the project. It had, they programmed reading groups, they programmed um, actually a really interesting event with the architect of the building that you can maybe see a bit through the windows, like the next door block, which was, I think that block is the only one on site that is affordable housing, so uh, aimed at people on low incomes. But obviously when developers put in for these huge redevelopments, there's a certain percentage of affordable housing they're supposed to allocate. And it's become clear <laughs> in the past couple of years that that didn't happen in King's Cross. And really there's just this one tower of isolated like, low earners amidst this like, really, really expensive um, real estate. And we had an event where the residents who lived around our building came to meet the architect who designed it and talked together about like what they felt like their building did for them or okay. didn't do or like how it sort of locked them away from the site or how it opened it up to them which was really interesting mm -hmm. and then we had a lot of um, events talking more broadly about kind of gentrification um, which were interesting and it also became like our workspace so we just were using this as our studio during the show um, which was really nice. I'm keenly aware we've been talking for quite a while so yeah. we'll just we'll wrap it quickly um, <laughs> run through the last few bits. So the next one is Inner Emotions, the moon, a symbol of disruption and madness but also playful. Here the moon reflects um, an uncertainty about Auto Italia, where are you going? 
Um, so this is for a project um, called Golden Age Problems. Um, and I think Golden Age Problems was kind of really interesting, this idea of, um, I think you're always better talking about this project than me, <laughs> but... Um, it was a lot about kind of um, refusing what... It was in particular collaboration with an artist called Nathan Budzinski, who um, we've worked with a lot on the TV projects. And he was interested in what can something like Auto Italia enable that something like Tate Modern can't. Like, what are these key differences between the big institution and how we work? And um, he kind of almost made—I don't know how to describe it. It's like a almost like an Adam Curtis film, but just with actual people in a space. So he created this whole uh, huge narrative um, linking kind of time travel with making films with artist-led spaces and had uh, Pablo who's here with his auto harp as the host that would take you all through and it culminated in this amazing song. Um, so it's like a really brilliant project that was um, sort of trying to test these ideas of, of how we can break away from an institution and what different space we can offer. And I think that's something, I mean, the moon, the uncertainty, mm -hmm. the craziness, mm -hmm. these are mm -hmm. things that we try and embrace with Auto Italia and try and make sure, retain a space within our programme. Yeah, and think of some really nice words here, like think of entanglement or disorganisation as something kind of really, that's really important, or, or a strength. And the final card, um, final result, Jupiter. A card denoting authority and suggesting that you may well end up with your own peaceful authority. Um, it's ambiguous as to the role of this, whether it's internal or external. Um, I feel like we've already kind of touched on this, but I think the authority we feel most with doing Auto Italia are the different criteria which we are judged against. So whether that be the Arts Council England as our main funder, how we have to speak to them, the different requirements, how we were saying earlier, this idea of kind of constant growth and expansion and uh, becoming bigger, how you prove these things, how in reality two people in London can kind of do like data analysis and quantify everyone who comes in when really we just want to chat to them and let them see the show without kind of thrusting a questionnaire at them. Um, how can we be confident within these terms? How can we be confident with what we're doing and how we talk to other people about it? It's probably one of the biggest challenges we face. Um, I think it's a nice idea to come back off this. So this idea of authority, I think like actually what we're really pushing towards now is it's really not being the authority in Auto Italia. And maybe if we just go on to the next image, which is a dream base, kind of really allowing Auto Italia to be just be taken over by other people. So this is a project we did really recently in September with an artist and female drag queen called Victoria Sin, um, whose work we've been really excited about for a long time and has been really involved in Auto Italia in different ways. Um, and I think she's really interested in this idea that sci-fi uh, and speculative fiction can be this tool to kind of decolonise imaginations and imagine these new futures which are anti-racist or feminist, um, or imagine different ways in which people can come together. Um, and she's also really interested in kind of her practice as like a female drag queen, also as sci-fi in this different way. So we kind of really explored this by turning Auto Italia into kind of like a club slash kind of like queer spaceship. I guess, um, and just had th uh, three days of parties and workshops and performances and just really allowed this whole kind of group of people that was around Victoria to come in and just really use the organisation and its resources and our time um, to produce this just like a massively exciting project about sci-fi. Yeah. Um, and this is one of the club nights. Um, we even booked like real life DJs who didn't think they were coming to like an art event. It was, just, it was just super, super fun. That's good. Um, but really, really kind of allowing it just kind of someone just to kind of run away with the organisation and do something with it. Yeah. I think it's good to end on this as kind yeah. of like an example of what Auto Italia can be used as mm. and what we think is still refreshing about it, particularly uh, within London. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, let's yeah. stop there. <laughs> so if anyone has any questions, we're happy to, happy to take them. <coughs> Or we could take a break. Or, we take a break. <laughs> or if not, it's okay as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so, if there are any question, maybe I would like to ask you about the whole notion of charity that is like inherent uh, or featured in your practice. Uh, 
So if it's all about, like you've been talking about sustainability and the whole problems with uh, fundraising and uh, the autonomy of artistic work and working peer-to-peer -peer with artists, uh, but uh, isn't it just a solidarity thing? Or if you can somehow uh, elaborate this whole notion of charity? So we are like re legally registered as a charity. Um, for many different reasons. In the past, things like discounts on business rates for your building, or it also enables us to fundraise in a particular kind of way. But um, I think the idea of charity, I mean, I'd always kind of be cautious about thinking of this idea of charity in the way in which we work with people more generally, because I kind of feel slightly anxious about this idea within charity that someone's kind of at the top and someone's at the bottom, and you kind of reaffirms a particular kind of structure, does the societal structure in many ways. But um, but yeah, I mean we kind of I mean this kind of goes this down to this, like, the name of this talk, this idea of kind of like shell corporation. Like the this the idea of shell corporation is this idea that Autotalia is this kind of empty company which we can kind of do whatever we want with and part of that is that it is a charity and um, we're able to use the charity to fundraise for particular arts funders so we can pull kind of resources into projects with younger artists who wouldn't be able to access that kind of funding otherwise. Yeah. It was a like it's a kind of like a strategic decision to become a charity as well. The opportunities that opened up seemed like it was completely worth it. Obviously there's like a different reporting, but because we're so small, it's not really that significant for us. Um, and kind of like what Ed was saying, it gave us immediate access to uh, business rate rent relief on certain buildings. We just get a cut as a charity. Um, we can apply to funds we wouldn't be able to otherwise. Mm -hmm. And I think I mean, this is like shows how uh, invested we are. But I can't uh, charitable aims. You have to have like your aims of your charity. That's super simple. I think ours is just to uh, promote and forward um, art through education, exhibitions, mm -hmm. etc. That's kind of the mission, so mm -hmm. it really feels like it doesn't contradict how we work anyway, but only actually adds another side to hopefully making us a bit more secure. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I was wondering, sort of practically speaking, how you decide on your output, I guess, because like collectively I would see that maybe there's more leniency or um, in terms of like taking responsibility for the projects. Um, and I was just wondering if you, you know, how you go through it, like if you all have to decide together on something or if you sort of let each other sort of have more freedom, um, like how it works. Mm -hmm. I think that it can kind of really vary. And I think at the moment with Kate and Marlene being away, for example, they engage on certain projects at different moments. Um, I mean, we're always forced to kind of set project agendas kind of further in advance to kind of keep ourselves sustainable so we can kind of keep funding coming in. I think um, historically projects might have just happened very, very, on a very, very quick turnaround and everyone may have kind of been more involved, but um, I think it's something that just happens quite organically at different moments, really. Um, yeah, we like, um, we try and we call it like an active research project, which sounds a bit uh, fluffy, but um, I guess we, individually bring what we're interested in, what research we're currently like engaging with, and I think it just happens that there's a lot of harmony between what everyone's interested in. Like, I've never had someone at Autotalia say, oh, this project's really amazing, I'm interested in exploring this idea, and I've been like, wow, I just feel like completely opposite to you. But there's definitely tensions that are really interesting to work out with each other, like, to do with, on all levels, like to do with what like aesthetically we're interested in in this moment, or interested in trying out what artists we're interested in. But I think what it results in is kind of everyone bringing a lot into it, and then a lot of time spent kind of untangling what it could become or what it could look like. Um, more recently, we've had a little bit of kind of different people leading slightly on projects. But I think there's just something as well to do with us being physically in London. If we're working on a project for London, we'll spend more time kind of really yeah. thinking that through. Mm -hmm. But it's still amazing to have the support and the opportunity to like bounce your ideas off these other people who are a little bit more of movement. I think it's like really important. Otherwise there is this risk of getting really like stuck in your own head and stuck mm -hmm. in your own way of doing it that might 
end up just being a bit repetitive or a bit boring. Mm -hmm. And similarly, this is why we always want to involve other artists too. So there's generally with projects this moment where we really feel like we've taken it as far as we can just ourselves and we should really invite other people in. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there's not kind of like a set way we do it, but it's a lot about developing themes or questions we're interested in and then trying to get other people to help us work through that and bring their own kind of interest to the question. You said earlier you were looking for new models of uh, economy to yeah. work uh, on, like, because you said you just like applied for your regular funding this year again. Mm -hmm. So I guess this is a bit contradictory with the fact that you're looking for some new solutions. Uh, did you? Is there some specific way you are uh, you want to explore right now? Some or. It might even, I think at the moment we're thinking of it in terms of maybe even how people, like how we personally work on the project. It seems like, so we're reapplying for the regular funding, but the regular funding is about £35,000 GBP each year short of what we need just to cover space and people's time, let alone the actual project costs. So we've been in this sort of cycle of fundraising to sit doing fundraising, to sit doing fundraising, and then you're like, um, when do we actually make work? And how can we make this a little bit easier? To make it easier, do we actually have to step back a bit and say that the model is, we all have another job, and this is done in a more part-time way, and Autotalia becomes you know, less, this is the sad thing, Autotalia would then have to become less kind of productive. It would have to become slower. It couldn't do as much. Um, or are there ways that we can negotiate that? Like we tried a few tactics this last year, all of which uh, failed. So we tried to we tried to get money from the um, GLA, which is um, the Greater London Authority, which is essentially the mayor's office in London. That I mean, it's kind of really weird. They have a fund called the Regener Regeneration Fund, and they're actively seeking uh, projects that people propose that might be to regenerate a certain area or a high street or like. Often the bids are massive, often it's companies being like, I want five million pounds to buy this whole um, studio block and turn it into a maker space and turn it into this and that. And our idea was that, well, could we <laughs> rephrase what Auto Italia does as this idea of a maker space? Like, we have a building sometimes, we're artists that come together, we produce work, we offer facilities to other artists, even if they're intangible, even if it's just support or advice or experience, could we frame this as what they're talking about, this idea of a maker space, a regeneration space, and could they actually fund us? Uh, but it didn't work. But this, <laughs> so, you know, this, that was one idea. I'm trying to think of other kind of alternative approaches we've had. We also were interested in whether we could become more like a co-producer, and to that be a, like an actual thing that could generate mm -hmm. money or like could we offer consultancy in some way could that be a thing to bring in revenue I think the hardest thing we find is that our time is so occupied in just doing the stuff for Auto Italia that there's not this kind of other zone where you can sit back and develop this other arm of it and I think with in terms of like co-production as well it would be like how do you find the artists to work with in that very specific way a way that would mean that they're bringing us on to help produce their show, but they're also bringing on, you know, like a budget to give us, because we've done co-production before that's really just resulted in us supporting artists, like we haven't made money from it, it's just been about kind of offering our, what we have. So again, it's like, these are the decisions we're trying to make now, is that actually viable? Is that something we want to focus on? And if it is something we want to focus on, how do we cut back the other stuff we're doing to make that happen? Mm -hmm. um, but from all these examples, is there something that you're most aiming to do? We're most aiming that we should just get public money to do what we do. That is like, that's the dream. And so we're going back into our regular funding and we're asking for more because our argument is that the Arts Council should give us enough money to just cover yeah. the running costs. And that is a way in London to keep experimental stuff happening. That's kind of one of the only ways. Um, I, I suspect we might be unsuccessful yeah. in this argument to them, but 
The that's problem actually, is as well, you're effectively going against like a grant giving body who is under the jurisdiction of, of a massively conservative government who not only pushed for Brexit, they also pushed for everyone to be a hugely kind of enterprising, free flowing, kind of nomadic capitalist producer. So the idea that or society should be entirely funded by the government and the yeah. government is crazy yeah, they because they're like, like why would we do that like why can't you generate seven times as much income from doing what you do from what we give you and there are certain organizations in london who do really well because they might be in a certain place in west london where um lots of patrons like to give them money because it's in their favorite park and um, that's a very specific example which, um, or certain celebrities might have given them money at different times and therefore it becomes like a particularly cool to kind of give money to this organisation as a patient but we're kind of always worried that like you can kind of go down these routes where like you spend all your life trying to secure private money from like random wealthy individuals and then all of a sudden you're like oh wait we didn't do a project for six months because we spend all the time asking like um, gentrify people in the UK for to give us like £500 a piece and then you're like what are we doing you know like <laughs> Like it's kind of balancing those two different things at that different moment, but um, we have no answers <laughs> <laughs> at all. <laughs> we don't. Um. Okay. Um, from your presentation, it looks like like a uh, like a dream. It's like a harmony you you are into, right? like, and I would like to know what are the biggest challenges and the biggest struggles you're coping with. And maybe like how to cope with like disagreements mm -hmm. in your in your group. I don't even know how big it is. And what procedures for making uh, uh, <coughs> decisions you use mm -hmm. if you work uh, with consensus or something else. I mean, it can sometimes feel like death by committee. Like definitely, like there are moments where that can could feel like the case. And I think that it's also kind of interesting as projects grow because they grow very quickly once they start going and I think we'll usually work kind of like one key collaborator so with Dream Babes Victoria is kind of the key collaborator and she'll kind of bring on a whole host of artists we'll also bring others involved as well and I think there can be moments where it becomes really difficult and, um, and I think there's also moments where people kind of expect us to behave as institution um, and sometimes where people expect us to kind of behave as artists and I think that's when we kind of get the biggest frustrations because Sometimes it's kind of about managing particular expectations and perhaps people think we're better resourced than we are or perhaps we want to be able to offer more production support than we can than we can, or a better piece of kit than we're perhaps able to offer for a show. And I think that's probably a time when we kind of get, uh, where we kind of might feel frictions because we can't always manage those expectations quite yeah. so fully. And there's definitely uh, frictions within us. There's, I mean, there's four people. I've been there for like five years now, it's like close working and definitely this like boundary of like friends and colleagues is something we have to navigate. I think it makes projects better that we do work in this way and the team is so close. Um, there are disagreements and I think often the disagreements are like even harder to deal with because it's from this like really close intense thing where like you've been working for 70 hours in a week on something and then you're just like haven't slept and something's gone wrong and people are upset but I also think that the, the closeness and the support of Auto Italia has made projects a lot better and that we always encourage each other to try and be more ambitious than we might even start out thinking we could be and that's something that like I really appreciate from the dynamic in terms of like working processes we try all sorts of different things it's definitely been different with people not there it's been a lot of Skype calls like all the time um, and we've sort of fluctuate between being like, oh, we'll just leave Skype on all day and chat to let's have a very specific meeting about a very specific um, decision. We also tried to use this um, working format we borrowed from the tech industry of like sprints where we'd have like a week where we just focus on programming and then a week we'd focus on fundraising and a week we'd focus on press, but it always disintegrates. You can start off doing it, but it's kind of like in the long term, everything is really messy and we are kind of doing a little bit of everything at the same time and trying to um, cobble it together. And sometimes things get forgotten and we look back and we feel like we really missed an opportunity, but also sometimes really exciting things can come out of that slightly messier, non-hierarchical way of working. Like there's a few different bits within that we take more responsibility for, usually like the more boring stuff. So like I am more do the finances, Ed more leads on the fundraising. There's like little sections that people are a little bit more 
leading on, but everyone does a bit of everything within it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, did you go uh, through like ideological factions, or do you have any like like political stance? Uh, you are sharing all, or do you have, do you have some like divisions? Uh, you were talking about sporting, about mm-hmm. gentrification, mm-hmm. and you're taking some political stance towards that and towards uh, art market. Mm-hmm. And so, how, how do you define yourself in that way? And how it works in the group. I guess kind of a nice way to maybe answer this question is kind of how everyone's kind of got involved. It kind of ended up working together. So like we said, Kate was the founder. We've all got involved really through kind of hanging out with Water Italia on a certain project, helping out something and then effectively kind of never leaving. And I think because of that, I think I we kind of have very, very similar positions and like our, our, our reasons for things are all very similar. And in terms of kind of having factions, I've never kind of experienced that within Auto Italia. I think because our roles in the organization have grown really organically. And we always kind of have this funny conversation of like, what if we had to replace someone? And it's kind of a funny conversation, one, because we get paid about a third of a normal salary for what is effectively one and a third normal like job. Um, I mean, we're working at six, sometimes seven days a week when it's program time for what is effectively like a third of a London salary. So we could never really replace someone on that level. We can never advertise for someone because everyone would be like, why would we apply for that job? Like, but also it's like, how do you replace someone within kind of an artistic collaboration, which is also a job? And that's kind of an interesting friction with Auto Italia. Um, and I think for that reason, we've never had a situation where we've kind of just brought someone in and we've been really surprised by their kind of like, even if it was just like a minor difference in kind of a ideological position, but, or even if it was kind of an extreme one, we brought someone in and they turned out to be kind of dreadful or like really, really difficult or like <laughs> have these secret awful views or I don't know, something like that. But um, generally, because of our dynamic and the way we've all kind of become part of Auto Italia, that's never been an issue that's kind of come, yeah. come across. And I think there's something in the people wanting to be working within something that is from a kind of grassroots history that still prioritises collaboration as this really like important and political stance almost, you know, to like reject a different way of working in favour of this, which can be harder and like earn you way less and you know like mm. I think there is something about the people that are drawn to that methodology and that way of working that m- tends to mean they're aligned in other ways as well I think mm-hmm. that's definitely yeah. what yeah, definitely. what we've found mm-hmm. so we haven't had any big bust ups about <laughs> about ideology but it could happen <laughs> Yeah, so we've had a couple of commissions from London institutions before. So we've worked with Tate Modern, the ICA, so maybe... Uh, and we've done a little bit involved with the Barbican as well. Oh yeah. But it's always been this kind of situation where Otto has approached as an artist, so they've wanted us to make a new piece or to show a new piece. And really interestingly, I think doing that has really shed a lot of light for us on how some of the ways we work more effective than a larger institution. I feel like sometimes larger institutions have less, like they don't often have knowledge of actually what making art is like. Like they have knowledge on sort of showing it and programming it, but maybe don't understand the processes as well as you do if you are an artist or have worked like more closely with them. So often we've had a lot of tensions between kind of like the institutional timelines people want. It can often, I don't know if you found this, but like you know, the conversation can really quickly be, oh, just give me this bio by tomorrow and just give me this and that's what we need. And we're like, no, we want to talk about the work and we want to talk about the ideas and we want to talk about why you want to show it. And, you know, that's something that's really shown us that we need to remember to prioritise those things. Like when we're working more as the, like, commissioner to really come at it as artists and, and remember, like, the most important thing or most exciting thing we ever get from collaborations is like talking about ideas and making you work together mm-hmm. and I think working with institutions the other way around has reinforced that for me anyway. Mm-hmm. 